wonderful cultural experiences in the city of Chicago. This morning, we will uh, cover cultural heritage and modernization in their first plenary and global threats to the global city in our second plenary. Uh, in between, uh, we will have uh, the pleasure of uh, hearing from the council's uh, co-chair on global food and agriculture to talk about urbanization and agriculture. Uh, we'll have some downtime. Uh, just on the other side in the uh, stock room, there is plenty of coffee and water and, and seats for conversation because not only do we want to have you be here to, have the to be part of the conversation that takes place on stage, we also want you to have the opportunity to mingle, uh, to get to know each other, to network, uh, and to develop new ideas about how we can deal with the challenges uh, facing our global cities. At this point, it is uh, my great pleasure to welcome James Rondow, the president and uh, Eloise Martin, director of the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, to uh, say a few words about the Art Institute and introduce the panel. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I am James Rondo, president and Eloise W. Martin, director of the Art Institute of Chicago and I'm very happy to welcome you to the museum and of course to this morning's session. The session, as you know, will examine how global cities maintain their rich cultural heritage and history while continuing to modernize and thrive as sustainable urban centers. As your presence, all of your presences here this morning reflects, works of art and other forms of enduring cultural expression are the richest legacies that each and every modern society leaves behind. Works of art being made today continue to help us define our present through the lenses of our shared histories and to better understand our shared histories through the lenses we are developing today. Works of art inherently propose fundamental and timeless questions about what it means to be human and more urgently, ask us to consider our responsibilities to one another and to our built environment right now. Here in Chicago, a relatively young global city, city, our civic identity and the identity of our cultural institutions have been and continue to be inextricably woven. The history of this city is a part of our museum's DNA. Our iconic Beaux-Arts building on Michigan Avenue was built during the Columbian World's Fair in 1893. Its class, classically inspired architecture reflected the aspirations of city, city leaders at the time to become one of the great cultural capitals of the world. From that moment forward, everything about how Chicago has grown corresponds exactly to how our museum has grown. As we've expanded, the city expanded and we integrated the feats in engineering and innovations in architecture that have come to define Chicago. We built over the train tracks about 1906. We built the glass curtain walls of the Morton Wing in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And of course, the openness and transparency of Renzo Piano's modern wing uh, continue to define our museum uh, since we opened in 2009. In other words, our campus reflects our city. This morning's distinguished panelists will discuss how global cities, such as Chicago, can preserve their cultural attributes while continuing to build and expand. And they will share their insights on the various roles institutions like ours can play in defining culture within global cities. With that, I wish you a great day, welcome you to our museum, and thank you for inviting me to welcome you. Have a great day. Ladies. And gentlemen, please welcome to the stage James Kuno, Min Jayang, Sultan Saud Al Qasemi, Rani Chan, Arna Quinza, and your moderator, Caroline Daniel. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be back in Chicago. I was the Financial Times correspondent here for three years, uh, from 2002 to 2005. And I remember uh, interviewing Anish Kapoor about um, the uh, bean he was creating for Millennium Park. And in the classic way of the uh, city of Chicago, 
Mayor Daly's office, insisted that his work had to last for a thousand years <laughs> as part of his contract. So I like the idea of a thousand years time, someone, Anish Kapoor's great, 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 great grandson might be sued by the next Mayor Daly um, for uh, if his work doesn't last. Anyway, we have a fantastic panel here today. Um, and I know we're going to be thrilled by the end of it and want it to continue. I'm just going to very briefly introduce the panellists and then we'll get down to uh, the cultural business. So on the panel we have Sultan al Qasimi. Uh, he's a Gulf-based columnist and lives north of Dubai. Uh, Ronnie Chan, uh, chairman of Hung Lang Properties and the longest CV I think I've ever seen, an incredible <laughs> spirit. Um, but I'm not going to read it all out to you, but... Um, if you want me to, I can. That would take, take up the whole panel, I'm afraid. Uh, Arna Quinza, an artist. I think you might be able to guess which one he is on the panel. <laughs> and... <laughs> uh, Minja Yang, uh, who spent many years at UNESCO and has an incredibly global background, working in many cities. And finally, James, or Jim Kuno, who probably many of you in the room know very well, formerly of this parish, now down in Los Angeles. <laughs> Something to do with the weather, maybe. And he's president and CEO of the Paul Getty Trust. So I'm going to kick off with Jim, actually, um, by, with a broad question, which is, what can cultural centres provide for global cities? Wow. Um, well, we learned last night, and of course we all know very well, uh, that uh, cities are growing and growing in importance. Uh, they've always been important, but they're growing in greater and greater numbers of population. Um, and that means they're extraordinarily dynamic. It also means they're always in evolution. They're always changing. And I, I reflect back on my great-grandfather, who was the first of my family to come to this country. Uh, he came from uh, Germany, and he came to B Brooklyn, which was then, in greater New York, the third largest German language-speaking country in the world after Vienna and Berlin. You wouldn't know that in Brooklyn today. Uh, so, so the idea of a city being a fixed entity is a, a, a fiction. And so it needs institutions that last a thousand years in, uh, in them to, to give a sense of gravity and place for all the people who are coming and passing through. And I think museums can fill that role, and I think they can do so in a couple of ways. One way is because these dynamic changes going on in the city means that increasingly people from different parts of the world are coming to reside in the city is they need a place, uh, they, need, they need to make a home in this place, and museums can offer them that because it has collections they recognize as being related to the parts of the world from which they've come. But it also means that they're moving next door to people who are strangers to them, and the strangers therefore need to know the background of the people who are coming, and they need to be able to, to, uh, to join together in some greater understanding of their new home and the worlds from which they have come. And museums can offer that by having these encyclopedic collections drawn from the world for the world, as the British Museum likes to say. I think it's also extremely important that in doing so, uh, they have a sense of a safe place in the city, which is a strange and foreign and dynamic place for them. And the museum can be that strange, that safe place. It can be a public meeting uh, house. It can be a place that is agnostic with regard to difference in the world or privilege in the world. Uh, at its very best, it is a, an introduction and to, uh, to the world and all of its great richness and strangeness, and they can make a home for the people here. In, we, certainly the way it works in Chicago. Um, I wonder if I can bring in Sultan. Um, we spoke on the phone about some of the tensions in the, the, in the Gulf, about the rise of these amazing, spectacular museums um, and the sort of art um, buying power of uh, some of the Gulf states. I wonder if you can talk about your perspective on that, because you were really interesting about how the desire to be seen as a global city and have these great cultural sort of uh, museums as actually causing tensions and their role in the uh, sense of the city. So um, if you think of the Gulf states, six states in, in, in what you call the Persian Gulf, um, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, uh, Doha, and other cities uh, have uh, embarked on a major uh, art buying spree over the past decade or so, buying artworks that you would recognize, such as 
um, you know, Cezanne's card players, for example, and, and many artworks from the Middle East to the degree that Doha and Qatar has now amassed the biggest collection of modern Middle Eastern art anywhere in the world, about 8,000 artworks. Um, well, these, these museums have uh, been seen as being aloof to a degree from some of the uh, local population. And it was only last year uh, that Doha, I think, took a very, very brave step to open what you know, the locals refer to as the Slavery Museum, uh, the Museum of Slavery, Bin Jalmud House. So for the first time, the Gulf cities are acknowledging some of the dark episodes in our history uh, and I think that this is uh, something that needs to be enhanced uh, with other issues such as, such as uh, you know, reflecting uh, current trends, current migration trends, current trends with regards to uh, geopolitics in the region. Um, one thing I had written about is how museums, for example, don't highlight the role of women in, in society, but this is also something that's changing. So there is a dynamic, and I think it's a very exciting time now for Gulf cities and Gulf museums. Do you think these um, kinds of museums are working? I mean, are they making it feel like a global city by having these great installations of expensive artworks? Um, well, I think it's important to... Uh, these cities are, are trying to position them themselves as connectivity hubs. They don't want to be local or regional. They want to be global. So uh, they are bringing in, you know, uh, uh, Murakami exhibitions, for example, and major shows. If you if you think of the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, which hasn't been built yet, but I I know that the collection, for example, is about two thirds Middle Eastern and one third sort of non Middle Eastern. So that's I think is a very healthy mix of uh, of art. When you visit Abu Dhabi, you want to see art from from the Middle East. So they don't want to position themselves only as global. They want to be uh, regional hubs as well. And I think their art collection now is reflective of that. But you, I think one of the other things you mentioned is the lack of engagement by locals in terms of they are for the elites quite often in terms of who visits them. Yes. So, for instance, um, let's say we can't pick on museums that haven't opened yet, although I'd like to, but museums that have opened, for example, have tended to be uh, seen as a bit of uh, aloof, distance from, distance from some of the local populations. Keep in mind, though, that cities like Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Doha are 90% non-citizen. Again, I repeat this number. This is unprecedented anywhere in the world. There's no other place on planet Earth where 90% of the population is not, uh, you know, does not hold local citizenship. I would say that perhaps what James said when, uh, you know, turn of the century uh, uh, in New York or some cities, maybe in South America, were this way. But today, on 21st century, uh, they, so they also want to cater to the 90%. You know, you want to cater to the South Asians and the Europeans and the Africans. Um, but they sometimes they tend to neglect the local citizens as well. I wonder if I can bring in Jim, who raised his hand. It, it, it's just a question about that, because uh, I think taking into account the s particular circumstances in the Gulf, uh, but, but, that's, but it's true in every city, I wish to think, it depends on where w w one uh, contribution a museum can make depends on its location in the city. And I've only been to Abu Dhabi, I've not been to the others, but uh, in Abu Dhabi they're, of course, on the exterior edge of the city. Mm -hmm. So they seem divorced from the city. You actually have to cross over to it, whereas Chicago, as just an example, the, uh, the, the planners, when they built this museum, put it at the center, the nexus of the city. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and what's extremely important about that, it seems to me, is not only does that make it proximate to where populations live and work, in, in the great untidy mess that they, in which they do live and work together. Uh, but it also means that it is a pu public institution at the center of the city. Mm -hmm. It isn't a commercial institution or a governmental institution, it's a public institution. So it's a sense of a common ground, mm -hmm. you know, right at the center of the city with all of its connections. And, and perhaps in the development of the cities in the Gulf, there is some, something's gonna take into account the role that the, 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 the dynamic structure of a museum plays in city planning. Uh, if I may add one, one last thing. So in Dubai, there's a district called Al Sarkal district, which is a, a very famous merchant family from, from Dubai. And the Al Sarkal family uh, founded this uh, space called Al Sarkal Avenue, where I think about three dozen art galleries are located. It's, it's almost like, um, uh, you know, uh, Soho, for instance, in, in, in New York. Uh, but it's smack in the middle of the industrial area. And so when you're walking around in a circle, uh, when the weather is pleasant, uh, you, uh, you, know, you encounter these expensive artworks that sell for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. But the place is also, you know, uh, sort of beaming with, with peop immigrant community, people from South Asia whose, whose income, I think, is, uh, you know, they can't afford this work. But it's really beautiful to see the, the coming together of different uh, stratas of, of income from, from across the Dubai society.
I wonder if I can bring in Anna because um, you've just, um, in fact, the nicest thing was I arrived in my hotel room yesterday and I received a wonderful book by Anna, which is about to come out. And I think most of us on the panel have also received the same, lots of nods, so we all got the same book. I wasn't just singled out for special treatment <laughs> because I'm the moderator. Um, and it's called uh, Cities Like Open Air Museums. Mm -hmm. And in it, you talk about the need to centre your work in people, in the relationship between the city and the people, rather than in the idea of a museum. And I wonder if you can just talk a bit about your work for people who don't know it and what you try to do when you arrive in a new city. So first of all, I think the... Um, the, 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 there's only one percent that visit uh, culture houses like like museums, operas, etc. And these people, I don't need to educate them uh, anymore. But my goal is to reach the other 99 percent in, in in cities, and my task is to to come in 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 cities where there are conflicts of um, vandalism, poor people, drugs, etc., etc., to try to restore that. Uh, to give them that, that this area is a new soul, a new ad identity, but most of all uh, a connection that people start to again to talk with each other. The most beautiful compliment I ever had is that when um, I have built an installation in Brussels, it was in a district, it was a very uh, rubbish district, and I, and I was trying to collect all the money to clean up that, that area and to build an installation. And the most beautiful compliment was that I had received a letter from a lady, I think 80 plus, and she said, thank you again, because thank you so much, because I'm talking with my neighbors through <laughs> that yeah. installation. So that's what I try yeah. to do. So for me, I believe, of course, in museums, I believe in operas, I believe in, in culture houses, they are so, so important. Mm -hmm. But the 99 other people, because they don't have only, uh, always the, the, the chance to have that kind of education of interest. So I always try to come in, in, in into the public area to create that uh, dialogue, and that's for me the most important thing. And how do you decide when you arrive in a city, which city you're going to build your installation in? Talk, talk us through the sort of process you have. Um, 20 years it was so difficult to, <laughs> to, to try to explain to, to the political um, uh, system what, because they're always afraid about about the voters, so what you are doing in the interventions, what you are doing in, in cities, especially in the Western um, uh, cities, they're always afraid about <coughs> changements. Mm -hmm. The more you go to poor countries, it's so much more easier to, to do something. But in the Western countries, they're always afraid of changements. And I remember a nice story, it was in Rouen, it was a city next to, to, to Paris, and the mayor asked me to, to build an installation on, on a very famous square, and I said, I can't do nothing here because there is, there is, there is, there will be not. Uh, I will not add value to your city. But I saw a bridge, and there was a bridge going over the Seine, and there was a bridge. And I said, "Can I, can I close that bridge?" And he said, "Are you crazy? Are you not because the forty percent of the traffic went over that bridge?" <laughs> and I said, "Okay, let's do it then." And <laughs> I closed that. I closed that bridge for three crazy. months. So you can, Im uh, you can imagine how the <laughs> the French people were yelling on me, insulting me. But there was another bridge. 250 meters on the left and 250 meters on the right <laughs> to cross over, but in the in the beginning you, you uh, and and I learned learned from that it was so important. They organized a petition against me. They organized uh, manifestations against <laughs> me, and in the beginning I was I was in really in in shock that this happened because I came there to give somebody to give something well to give something back to the, to the city, but. What it was nice that because we had the installation there for three months and on three months we had almost like two two million visitors, mm -hmm. the same people that was protesting um, against our our, our uh, installation, there were the same people that was holding thousands of candle candles mm -hmm. in the night Let's before go. we dismantled the installation, mm -hmm. and the emptiness after was so much bigger than the emptiness before. Mm -hmm. That was five years later. The mayor decided to organize a competition for architects to close that bridge forever and to give it back to the city. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good. I wanna, thank you for that. I wonder if I can bring in uh, Minja on uh, some of your relationship, because in your work at UNESCO, um, you've, you've moved not just from looking at saving heritage sites, but thinking about how you create a culture associated with cities. Um, yeah. Perhaps you can just talk about, about your experience in this way. Well, uh, actually, um, I'm not an architect, I'm not a cult, uh, you know, art historian. I, I come 
I, I, I have a sociology background, and I started my first 10 years in the UN was at the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, where I, was, where I became sensitized at the culture-based conflict. And then from there, for personal reasons, I moved to Paris and, and, and quickly got involved in World Heritage uh, sites. And uh, being um, a sort of a appointed as a coordinator for World Heritage Cities, it's really changed a lot because first from sort of grand historic monuments and the surrounding area, and uh, it slowly became um, urban conservation areas, you know, that involved uh, like normal houses. And it was part of UNESCO's effort to um, a sort of democratize culture and that culture is not just the vestiges of the kings and the, and the religious leaders, but of, of the ordinary man and woman. So, um, which also raised a new kind of um, conservation challenge because it wasn't just the government's paying, you know, to uh, conserve something or to animate these places. It had to really, uh, you know, involve the, the population, the actual owners of, the, of these buildings that were under World Heritage Protection. And although World Heritage is considered to be sort of the ultimate branding and a lot of cities are really going after, there's a very, very long list of uh, cities uh, vying to get this World Heritage recognition. But of course it's true. I mean, it is a brand. It does bring tourists uh, there. And, uh, but what we try to do at UNESCO is that we define culture as a way of life. I mean, it's just a set of values that uh, you know, make people tick. And, and so cities are also places where all these different ethnic groups uh, converge, where the, 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 the risk of tension is far greater than maybe in the rural areas where people were able to live. So my work has really been um, mainly working with local authorities. And, and being that we're intergovernmental agency, of course, we have to go through the national government. And every government has different laws. I mean, every country has different laws, so it's been quite sensitive. But I think I've been really working for the last 30 years of my professional life with local authorities. And it's a, it's a great satisfaction to, you know, um, finally have these local authorities understand what we mean by culture. And, uh, and even in terms of museums, for one, at one point I was like a head of the museum department for like uh, one year before I got my dream job of being posted in India for South Asia. But um, there, uh, the kind of museums that we were going for were not sort of major institutions because they don't need us for that. But a lot of little places along the uh, city where people can just move from one place to another. And in the city of Luampaban in Laos, where I've been involved in personally for the last 20 years, uh, actually you know, being very operationally involved, is that because of the so-called outstanding universal value for which a site is put on the World Heritage List, we had a small museum for the nature culture link, which is one of the World Heritage outstanding universal value. One was a little small museum for um, the, the fusion of uh, traditional uh, architecture, vernacular architecture with a sort of colonial architecture. So that's one interpretation center. And another was um, on the urban pattern, the juxtaposition of the village uh, form and the colonial grid. So we try to um, have uh, cultural centers also become um, a way for people to understand what the attributes of that city is. So, I mean, I've really, and as I was saying earlier, in fact, um, being a World Heritage Coordinator, people think, wow, that's a great job, etc. But I can assure you that most of my work has been involved in discussing with local authorities what sort of rubbish you know, bin they should have or what sort of <laughs> sewage systems and don't break uh, you know, the urban uh, form by increasing the road. Uh, let's try and find a solution for traffic and, and deviate the main traffic, not through the whole historic area, but elsewhere. I mean, it's really about the, the, really the nuts and bolts of uh, the, the city. A, a lot on transport, a lot on transport. Well, talk, talking of transportation, apparently we have a picture of Arna's bridge <laughs> show up oh, yes. behind us. So, uh -huh. for people, has it gone up? I can see it here. Uh, oh. oh, fantastic! Mm. Yeah. Oh, right. Good. Little visual moment. Uh, <laughs> put it on Instagram. Um, so, I'm going to bring in Ronnie now. I think. Um, you have an incredible record in terms of world heritage sites, and particularly in China. 
And one of the things you were saying in the green room just now is that you're the only non-emperor <laughs> to have built buildings in the Forbidden City. <laughs> I wonder if you can talk a bit about your imperial uh, heritage work. <laughs> well, uh, Beijing has an imperial palace that is uh, almost 600 years old. And about 25 years ago, I got an opportunity to uh, rebuild uh, part of it because it was burned down. So there was the only site inside the imperial palace that is empty. And when Sam and Donna and I used to serve on the border roll boards together, we used, I, I took them there. And I'm happy to say that it is now completed. It took me 18 years. Uh, I said, before I start, uh, 18 years ago, I was torn hands on my army, but now look <laughs> at me, right? So don't try it. But uh, those are, uh, I've done a lot of that stuff in Hong Kong as well, as well as in many cities in China. And um, it it's really adds a lot to the city uh, by completing a part of uh, the Imperial Palace. Uh, probably people don't even know <coughs> that it existed. Mm -hmm. that but, but I think that uh, spiritually, it is so important to the Chinese people, and indeed it's not just the Chinese heritage, it's really world heritage, the, the Imperial Palace in Beijing, that you know, I can have the opportunity to complete uh, a part, uh, the, the last bit of it. Uh, and I think that's a, a contribution, and not to mention that gives me the honor of being the only non-emperor to have ever built 24 <laughs> buildings inside the Imperial <laughs> Palace. But I'm now doing another one, which is I was invited by the Palace Museum to do the third one, which is even more significant. That's basically the White House of the um, Qing Dynasty. That's where the emperor lives, eat, meet his ma mandarins, uh, and, and, and enjoy his artwork and so forth. So come back next time. Uh, Chicago is a wonderful city, so is Beijing. Let me know, I'll take you there. <laughs> <laughs> But you've also said, I'm going to stir it up a bit, that, and I'm going to quote you from something which was uh, in an interview a few years ago about the mess they'd made of the interior after you'd left. Um, it was changed so it looked like a five-star hotel. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you can sort of touch on that and your feeling about Chinese attitudes to heritage mm. um, preservation in general. Well, first of all, the Chinese know how to build, destroy, and build again. They don't know how to do build, destroy part of it, and restore. Yeah. So when I did that, it was never done before in China. Mm. And so I had to bring in experts from around the world in order to help me complete the, the, the task. And uh, China is just busy economically trying to make life better for the 1.37 billion people. Mm. They haven't had time to really sit down and think through what the cultural heritage of the country ought to be. I'm, I'm optimistic because if you look at Chinese history for the last four or five thousand years, they are really one of the forces of cultural advance, advancement. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that in the last 300 years, China has been so poor. And when you're poor, you don't think about culture. You think about food, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and now that China, after 30 years of very, very rapid uh, development, building you know, hundreds of cities and museums and what have you, now they are waking up and say, hey, yeah. there is something more than that. It is not just the hardware. Mm -hmm. It is very much the software, the cultural aspect of it. And they, they, they just don't have a concept of it. So, for example, what I did was on the outside of these 24 buildings, I had zero uh, liberty to do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. It is exactly the same way as it was, same material, same method of construction mm -hmm. and so forth. But the inside, nobody knew what it was like. So I had a lot of liberty <laughs> to, 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 to use my imagination to, 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 to merge <laughs> the old motifs, for example, uh, of the Chinese imperial uh, era and then put them in a modernity. So it is really modernity in, in, in antiquity and antiquity in modernity. After I left, uh, well, I had a two and a half year uh, construction, uh, a management contract with the Palace Museum with the hope that I would not only set the standard of restoration, but also set the hope of management thereafter, which is every bit as important as we all know. And then after I left, they turned that into a club and then turned them into a five-star hotel looking thing inside, uh, which saddens me very much. I said nothing. My staff, uh, whom some of you know, Jim, you know her, her Minja, uh, she was so upset. Uh, and I said, well, you know, we did something for the country. We did something for mankind. Forget about it. You know, this is beyond your control and mine. Right? But nonetheless, when there's an opportunity, I did tell the director, I said, hey, director, you, know, you shouldn't do that. Right? W what we did on the inside was we left it mm. half done. Half done yeah. We purposely leave it so that you can see the trusses, <coughs> how the wood come together. We didn't paint it. 
The outside is all painted beautifully, but inside you can see the original wood mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, and so I still ho hope that perhaps one day it will restore back to the, the way I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm culturally challenged, so uh, <laughs> I'm no standard of anyone uh, in this audience. So the way that the original empire, em, em, the original yeah. empire wanted it to be? Not really. <laughs> uh, the outside, yes. Yeah. But the inside, we don't know what it was like. Uh, and, 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 and so we have to use imagination, which I think is wonderful. But last, last year, on, for those of you who came, uh, we had a great session last year with Wang Shu, the uh, mm. Pritzker Prize Shui. winning uh, architect, who I've just mispronounced. Mm -hmm. um, I can never speak Chinese. Um, and he was fascinating about um, talking about him growing up in Beijing and that how in the last 30 years, China had destroyed 90% of its traditional buildings. Um, I wonder if, um, Ronnie, you can touch on that as a, obviously you're a major property developer in China. I didn't how destroy them. <laughs> how, you think, how you think about these this tensions between, you know, what you can save and the desire to develop and build in China. And then perhaps I can bring in um, you as well. So Ronnie first. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I brought some brochures. It's out there somewhere on the project, the 25 buildings that I restore. Uh, so you, you just pick up a copy if you like. Uh, I think that uh, China is, uh, mankind, uh, forget about China, mankind has an opportunity right now that I think that, it will do well for us to grab together, and that is, they are building so many cities. Mm. Uh, last count, 460 to 470 cities in the last three, 35 years. And if it is one million people a city, that's 470 cities. How many cities in America that has one million people or more? Anyone know? Nine. Hmm. Okay. Number nine is San Jose, you may, you, in case it surprises you. But in China, they built 470 of them that are 1 million people or more, all within the last 35 years. And so I think that that surely provides tremendous opportunity uh, for, uh, for, for the um, cultural side of things to grow. Uh, I, I, I think it this way. When you look at a city, there is the tangible endowment and there's the intangible endowment. The tangible endowment, for example, mm -hmm. it's nice to have water and, and mountain. Chicago has water, Chicago doesn't have mountain. But you know, Sydney, Hong mm -hmm. Kong, Rio de Janeiro, you know, you can think right away, think of cities that are just amazing because of the natural endowment. And then of course you have the city planning, you have the architecture, mm -hmm. right? Yesterday I went on an architectural tour, it's amazing mm -hmm. uh, in Chicago. But anyway, so 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 that's in physical, tangible endowment. And then you have the intangible. And I, I cite a couple of things. One is, you may sur be surprised, how about food? Food is certainly part of cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. And we in Hong Kong knows it very well. Many people from China and all over Southeast Asia come to Hong Kong to eat, mm -hmm. right? That's our heritage as well. You go to a city like New York and London. Those are the two, only two cities I know in the world where every night you can go to uh, a different uh, musical en uh, engagement uh, from jazz, bluegrass, classical, what have you. Or you want to go to a theater. Every night you can go to 30 of them. Mm -hmm. You have 30, uh, 40, 50 to choose from. And, and then you have another thing, art, public art is another thing. You can have one public art and make a city, almost. Mm -hmm. right? Or an architecture, right. like Bilbao. You can, you know, uh, so, so art and, 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 and architecture. Another one is uh, 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 shopping. Uh, sorry, it's my business. But anyway, I have to make some money, right? Uh, and Hong Kong has a reputation for being a shopping center of that part of the world. Uh, think about uh, another one, uh, universities. Yeah. Any city that doesn't have a great university is missing a, a whole lot. And it's not just the university itself, not just the campus, but what comes out of it, mm -hmm. right? The artistic, the scientific, the technological uh, businesses and so forth that comes out of that is just, uh, is just very, very rich. Mm -hmm. And so China, uh, is now turning from just physical constructing those buildings, uh, th those cities, into something more enriching, which is per perhaps more akin with China's 5,000 years of history. I told Jillian, I, I told um, Caroline before, I said, do you know in the year 2000 to 2012, uh, 2010 to 12, within those three years, how many museums were built in China? 3,000. Right now, they only have 4,000 plus in the whole of China. And much of that is built within the last five, seven years. And what about the content of it, right? 
So when you think about it, the opportunity of China finally entering into the global family of nations, not just in economic terms, political terms, but also in cultural terms. I think the Chinese, if they do it right, will enrich mankind by all that. And it's not just the Chinese art. Now, nowadays, it's really a blend of modernity and antiquity and also a blend of East and West. Mm -hmm. Jim, I want to bring you in. Yeah, I, I think Ronnie raises a, a very important question, and it goes back to the Emirates as well, and that has to do with the, where is the impulse for this creation of cultural activity coming from? And it's very difficult, I think, for it to be imposed upon from above. It seems more convincing and more lasting if it derives from below. And my understanding of the museums in China, and I've visited only a few of them, of course, because there are so many thousands of them that are new, but there were some, and this I've been told to be accurate, Ronnie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that it was determined by the Chinese government, whatever that means, the national government, that they wanted to build, they wanted to have more, per, more museums per capita than any other nation in the world. So they determined that the United States was the nation that has most museums per capita, capita and so they wanted to one-up that. So they, cre they created a goal for a certain number of museums, thousands of museums, so that they could have, simply by the mathematical uh, calculation, more museums than any other nation in the world per capita. Uh, you know, that's not the way that it seems to me that sort of um, evolve a, 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 a cultural richness uh, of a nation. Another example of that, I think, is in India, and where you've got the nationally developed uh, museums in Delhi, which are hardly visited and uh, are hardly managed, I should say, as well. Uh, but then you've got the former Prince of Wales Museum yes. in Mumbai, and it's dynamic, and it's, it's the creation of local merchants and local families for local people, and it, ca it came from the community. And it's, got, and it's been 100 years and more that it's, it's been dynamic. So it depends on when one's creating these cultural centers, where, where does the impulse come from? And how does it then knit back into the community? So with your hat on at, at the Getty, um, how do you look at China in terms of what they're doing with their museums? Are you, are you starting to think about giving them money or investing in them? Or do you think that the attitude is, is anathema to the kind of work you're trying to do at the Getty? Uh, well, so we've done three things, so um, and uh, are, are doing three things in China. And one of them we've been doing for more than 30 years, and that's in Dunhuang, the, yeah. ca the Buddhist caves in the far west of China. And that's because of one person, really. That and um, and that one person is Dr. Fan, mm -hmm. this kind of incredible, dynamic woman who, for 45 years, has pretty much saved Dunhuang in these caves. Um, and she had and she had such vigor and such toughness even during the uh, uh, during the revolution that that uh, the government, state government, the state administration for cultural heritage had to deal with it because she couldn't let them, mm -hmm. she wouldn't let them not deal with it. And so we worked through her with them, and they began to realize that the work that she was doing, that we were helping her do, was going to be lasting. And it was about not just con conservation of these painted caves, that it was about site management because with the rise of tourism, domestic tourism in China, they're at they're some peril. So we're working there. The other thing that we've been trying to work on is with museums, but the museums have been increased, they, they've been built so rapidly, and they're not staffed with, with staff that's experienced, so that are ed educated with regard to museum management and, and, and t technologies. So trying to work with them on that, but where do you start is one problem. And the third is with art history, because uh, there isn't a developed art history within the academic world of China. Uh, rather, there's archeology span on the one hand and yeah. art making on the other, but the art history in between. And again, it's a matter of where does one start, because there are so many new museums, no, so, so many new universities rising so rapidly in China. It's, it's you've got to pick the right ones. You have to pick the right partner for it to last. Mm. Um, Minjur and then Anna. Yeah. But I think uh, that in China they they did not only understood the power of museums, but also the power of public art, because we are engaged in so many cities from the beginning when when they start to build new cities, how to implant uh, uh, big monumental art installations. And I remember they, uh, they asked us to come to Tai Lake. It's, it's a two hours drive from, uh, from Shanghai. And they asked us to build an, uh, a new, new installation. I said, let's go big. And I didn't I make the drawings and the models for 52 meters high installation. And they were just laughing me out. They doubled the size. So it's now 102 <laughs> meters. Uh, but the Chinese, what I, what I really appreciate is, I think it's one of my favorite countries, if I can say, because they have they have not really um, an example for them. They are so big in the world that they need always to, to, to grab bits and parts from all over the world and to try to reinvent them themselves. But what I like with, with, with Chinese people is that the Chinese government, that they are 
able to make the steps. When they have an ID, they're really doing it. And that is what I really like with Chinese people. Yeah, what I wanted to add in the subject of this of heritage and modernity is that, um, you know, often UNESCO is considered to be uh, conserve, conserve, freeze a city. But it's not at all like that, because uh, there's now a new recommendation, a 2011 recommendation on the urban, uh, historic urban landscape. And this is really about continuity in tradition. So uh, take an example of the city of Strasbourg. Um, and the, again, the outstanding universal value and what makes it a World Heritage Site is the three um, sort of frames. The blue frame of the river and the canals, the green frame of the mountains and the, you know, the, 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 uh, the green area. And then added to that was the red frame of the tramway system, the public uh, you know, transportation system. So now, from a very small part of the city that is World Heritage nominated, I mean inscribed, they're now extending it to the German period hmm. part of the city, to Neustadt, which like is three times the size of what the historic center is. And further on, because of the World Heritage status of the Franco-German sort of cultural base, now it's comforting the mayor's new policy, the current uh, mayor's new policy, of creating a the so-called Euro district of both of a French and a German administrative entity that is transboundary. And so this is also how culture can also uh, become a locomotive, you know, where heritage can also be a vector for uh, development. And where we talk about, you know, historic urban landscape is, for example, the view. I mean, it's, it's normal, you can't stop a city, you can't stop a, a built environment, you know, as it is with population rise or, you know, with development. So what we ask for is to make sure that, like the, the view uh, corridor uh, of to the old city can be seen from the new city, or that there wouldn't be a, uh, a, a new building right smack, in, you know, behind the, the, the cathedral sphere or something. So I think that, I mean, it's very misleading for people to think that, um, you know, entities like UNESCO are just like, really trying to preserve um, cultural heritage before thinking about development. But on the contrary, we also consider that culture is really one of the main vectors of sustainable urban development. Anna. When you speak about the view about uh, cities, when I was as a, a small child, you know, I, I had a shoebox, I made a little hole in it and I made my own visionary uh, cities. But the day when I start to travel, I was so disappointed because all the cities all over the world, they start really to look the same. Apartment blocks, city blocks, the big blocks where they put all so many people in. And, and, and that for me is so, such a uh, was a big disappointment. Mm -hmm. So what I would love to see in, in cities is that they they would give the, the, the freedom to uh, entrepreneurs, to construction, to build so high as possible, but to, to put a law on it, like for every 20 stores that they, floors that they build, they need to donate something back to the, to, the, to the city itself. And for me, the airspace of the four first levels of the city belongs really to the people. Mm -hmm. And if we could change that, that level in, in a sort yeah. s a kind of um, human, garden, that's the moment that we will change cities. And that is so much more important. And I don't care if there, there is a tower in my, in my city of 100 of two of 300 meters high. I, I don't care. Mm -hmm. And also we need to build so high as possible mm -hmm. because the footprint yes. on, the, on the planet. Yeah. But for me, so, mo so much more important is that the four first mm -hmm. airspace uh, levels in a city. And that we need to give back to the to the people that live in cities mm -hmm. through cultural uh, events and not only behind the four uh, closed walls. I, w I wonder if some of the panelists can touch on the issue about globalization. Obviously, in politics at the moment, we're seeing a big uh, retaliation against the idea of globalization and, you know, and the 1% and so on. And you know, we're talking here about global cities, and yet I, w I wrote down earlier something you'd said about you know, the World Heritage City you know, and how we create them to bring in tourists. Now, in some ways, that sort of distills the problem. This is trying to create, you know, something to attract mm -hmm. tourists, not about really generally, you know, um, empathetic cities for the, for the citizens. Mm -hmm. so I wonder if um, what if you, so any of you can jump in about the sort of some of the tensions we're seeing now against globalizations as we talk about global cities all becoming the same. 
I, I, one aspect of this, this reaction against globalization, of course, is increased nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a sense of wanting to find a place and hold a place for oneself in this very mobile world. And I think the danger of that, of course, is just putting up false barriers mm -hmm. around that place and prohi prohibiting others from taking advantage right. of the opportunities afforded the, those who are already within that place. Yeah. Because uh, I think what we all, and, and we're seeing it with a, with a terrible situation in which of uh, Im immigrants putting themselves at risk now, is that people are, and they have a right to, it seems to be a fundamental human right, to, s to seek a better life for themselves and their family. Yeah. And we should, we should reduce the barriers rather than increase the barriers uh, for, uh, in, in people's way in pursuit of that. Uh, so I think one of the dangerous things about globalization is something which I, I know there are economic uh, you know, constraints, and I know there, there are problems that, it w in some cases, which, which hurts people's lives rather than enhances people's lives. But it's, an, it, it's inevitable, it's been inevitable ever since people began moving about this earth. And so it's a, it's a matter, I think, of, ma of managing this, uh, this activity this, th rather, rather than prohibiting this activity. Mm -hmm. uh, Sultan, I wonder if I can bring <coughs> you in on, <coughs> on the issue about it's sort of nationalism and uh, globalization. Um, well, well I, I think I have two things to say here. So um, I, I don't know if you, if, you, if you follow the Middle East, you know that it's not the calmest place in the world. Uh, you know, sometimes there's some tensions in the region. Well, there's <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the truth is that culture and museums and you know, art play a major role mm -hmm. in, in detoxifying this, uh, this tension this sectarianism that's emerging in the region that's very dangerous and I think it's detrimental to the, to the, to the long-term peace and stability of the region. The, you know, the, f the wars that are taking place, uh, cities like Dubai and the, the museums in Dubai, they're the only places where uh, Iranians and Arabs can share each other's art. You can, you can visit galleries in Dubai and see work by Iranian and Arab artists side by side. And there's something about that that really reinforces the sense of humanity, the sense that you, 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 you all belong to the same, I mean, the same region, but also the same uh, uh, planet. So uh, yes, I think I'm a huge proponent of, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of these museums and uh, galleries doing that. That's true. Well, globalization seems to equal homogenization. Mm. And there, must, there is an economic uh, basis for that, and there's a reason for that. Uh, for example, it improves the livelihood of many, many people who are in the developing world. And so let's not say that you know, that's all bad or wrong. Nope. It's just a thing that human society everywhere <coughs> tend to move towards. And then just as you know, I see very little reason to, uh, to, to make globalization into a religion, let's also not make the opposite of it a religion, okay. that uh, if you want to be more individual, individualized, you want to be more local character, that, that's fine. But let's move. Uh, let everyone have the have the have their say. Have the have the right to do what they want to do. China, for example. I mean, all the city look exactly the same. I get up in the morning. You know, I open the the, the curtain in, in my hotel room. I have zero idea where I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, 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 th th that's homogenization. They, they call it globalization too. Uh, you go to the shopping centers, which I built. I'm a real estate developer of world class shopping centers. And uh, they complain that, you know, I go to Dubai a lot. All the shopping centers, you have the same, exactly the same shops in my shopping centers. I was in D Rodeo Drive, every shop is in my shopping center. So you may say that that's boring, it's no good. Well, uh, it's good to a certain extent. But on the other hand, I think society will move in <laughs> undulates and then it will move back to an area, uh, to a place where perhaps it's not as homogenized. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, um, you said, when I mentioned tourism earlier, I, it wasn't at all to be negative about tourism, because I think tourism is very good. I mean, UNESCO considers tourism as a form of education for intercultural dialogue and, you know, mutual understanding, etc. But the only thing is that it's to try to avoid the sort of oasis approach of very pretty, beautiful, historic centers in a place, and the rest is just, you know, n'importe quoi, you know, development around it. So we said, no, it shouldn't be an oasis approach. It should be the core uh, heritage should be sort of be the heart, you know, that pumps the blood and irrigates to the rest of the territory, and to have a territorial approach towards heritage, you know. So I think that that, and, and, and as I said earlier, even the historic monuments, the masterpieces of architecture, are very important. It's absolutely important to preserve them, but 
not only, because if those attributes are, are, are recognized, then also the vernacular architecture attributes could also be recognized. So it should be sort of like a cascading kind of uh, approach towards uh, uh, culture as a form of uh, mutual understanding and respect of, of people of all walks of life. Yeah. So um, in the, in the uh, oil boom era of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, um, cities like Dubai uh, un unfortunately um, witnessed a lot of destruction of their cultural heritage. Uh, the the uh, beautiful uh, turn of the century, uh, you know, uh, 19th century uh, uh, houses that are on the creek, on the water side, that are unfortunately made out of corals, you know, but it's a fact that they were there, that were, were completely knocked down. And then uh, there was a realization that to avoid the homogenization that you were talking about, that all the cities look alike, that, that people are actually interested in going to visit these, these, uh, these old relics. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so in the past 15 years, there's been a major uh, re uh, uh, reinvestment protection laws that protect these uh, uh, heritage houses. And today, when you see the, 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 uh, when the emir of Dubai and the rulers, uh, when the sheikh has dignitaries, he takes the dignitaries to these heritage areas. Mm. He doesn't take them to the shopping mall and to <laughs> these towers. They want to see the old culture of the, yeah. of the city. Right. So, what, so what's your role in, in trying to improve on that? Let's just talk some specifics and practical details. What would you like to see? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I think this is my, major, my biggest accomplishment in my entire life, was writing an article. And what happened was, uh, I, you know, I visited one of those giant uh, real estate uh, fairs in Dubai, and I saw this beautiful area uh, uh, in Dubai that had, uh, a I think, a, what I think is a heritage building uh, designed by a, an American uh, architect of Palestinian origin. And, and smack in the middle, in the, the location of that building was this giant, uh, you know, uh, horrific tower that was coming up. And I, and I was completely, you know, horrified. And I, and I went and I wrote an article about the importance of that building that was designed by this uh, uh, architect who moved to Stanford, Connecticut, a very famous story. And then, and I feel, uh, uh, I was called in by the authorities and they said, well, you didn't know how important this building, and, and we, uh, this building is, and we promise you it won't be destroyed. So, so I feel like, you know, in a small way, I contribute through my writing mm -hmm. to, to highlight the importance of these uh, buildings. They might not be old in your, uh, uh, you know, your, your calendar. You come from a country that has 5,000 years history. But for us, a building from the 60s and 70s actually has a lot of heritage to it. A lot of people lived through it. A lot of people, you know, uh, it contributed to the development uh, of the city. So we were able to protect that beautiful, uh, you know, uh, mid-20th century uh, building mm -hmm. because of that. Um, Ronnie, again in the green room, we were talking a bit about Singapore um, and your admiration for the city. <laughs> um, not entirely. I wonder if we can talk a bit about what makes a very effective, cultural, you know, great city to live in. Because you've all travelled amazingly around the world, all the people on the panel. And Ronnie, if I can just start with you about that, about what, what you think. You were talking about the role of mess in a city and how important that is to the culture of the city. Okay, I am stepping on ter dangerous territory. <laughs> My good friend, uh, Ambassador <laughs> Chen Hongqi, is sitting right here in front of me. I'm really worried now. But anyway, th th I think most people would agree with me that they are cities that have character, cities that have a soul, cities that are interesting, not necessarily beautiful, because it's, you know, uh, it's in the eyes of the beholder. And, you know, I, I allow me to just name a couple of cities that in, in that category, for example, uh, New York City, whether you like it or not, it has character, it has a soul. <laughs> London, Paris, Hong Kong, San Francisco, a little bit smaller, uh, and in China, very few, Shanghai. Then allow me to say, to, to list, in my opinion, a few cities that lacks that, that soul. Uh, I lived 16 years in Los Angeles. Economically, it's very vibrant, I know that. It has, you know, some areas, you know, entertainment, defense, and this and that. Mm. But, you know, sorry, Jim, you live there still. Uh, <laughs> uh, I serve on the board of a company in Houston, <laughs> and I go there all the time. And I never really say, oh, I look forward to going to Houston. Uh, <laughs> I look forward to going to New York or London or Hong Kong You or have a happy audience here for uh, Houston. <laughs> uh, Frankfurt, right? Uh, uh, Beijing. It's really sad how they destroy so much, you know, in Beijing. Uh, and uh, <coughs> finally, uh, perhaps Singapore. Everything works in Singapore. And the government is so efficient and so good. But, uh, uh, you know, I said, you know, there is imp uh, 
uh, imperfection will perfect beauty. <laughs> a little bit, not too much. <laughs> <laughs> and a home, if a home is pristine, not, not pristine, clinical, then it's no longer a home. You want a little bit of chaos there. <laughs> and let me tell you, if Singapore government is convinced by what I say, that they need a little bit more chaos to make them more interesting, they will organize some chaos. <laughs> 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 and, <laughs> and, and, you know, for example, uh, years ago, they redo some of the shop houses. And the result of it is, you know, you can tell it's the government who did it <laughs> because they are perfect. <laughs> and there are some, uh, and, and, and that's why I like the private sector much more than I like the public sector. I wasn't smart enough to go to Chicago for, to study economics, but nonetheless, in general, I, know I agree with them, that private sector can do so much more uh, and, and so much more dynamic. The government in Singapore does best of any government I know. But I think that if they can add some element of the private sector's creativity in it, the city will be even a greater city. And so I think, <coughs> I think that uh, I, I really like Bangkok. <laughs> I know that, you know, uh, Jillian gave him a little bit of a hard time yesterday. Uh, but, you know, uh, Ani, Bangkok is wonderful. What but happens in Bangkok chaos. stays in Bangkok. But, but, uh, uh, anyway, right. enough said. I'm going to bring in Anna, not just because he's just said something elusive about Bangkok. Um, but you, we talked a bit about the other day about how you arrive in a city and who you talk to to try and get, a, as an artist, a feel and a mood of the city, and an instant dislike or a kind of... Yeah, that's true. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Because we've got a few more minutes and then we're going to do Q&A. But just your perception from a different point in the... Uh, you know, because you, you said that you, you lived... Uh, you left school quite young and you worked... I, I was a lucky one that, that I, I left the house. It was 14 years and a half and I lived on the street for six months. So I really know how to read uh, cities. And today, <coughs> I really can explore still. I'm also lucky how I look. I can enter in the slums and I can also... up go up to the to the towers the high towers and so for me it's f when when i walk in the cities it's I, I love it to to absorb the energy people air uh, the smells the good and the bad ones um and and that is one of my my uh, most most luxury things that i have through my job passion is to discover all these kind of different cultures and that is what i always try to give back in my public monumental installations and which city would you never work in? I had um, a proposal to do something in Moscow. And I think how the way, how they react, how they're cutting freedom out of um, their people. I refuse to do uh, a big monumental installation on the Red Square. Oh yes, I can refuse. And I have the freedom to say no. With that, I'm going to move into Q&A in the room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to go straight for the man in the front. I assume there'll be uh, there's someone rushing to you. Uh, I'm Charles Moore. I'm a board member of the Council on Global Affairs. Ronnie, do you think there's a role for private enterprise to work against homogenization, globalization, preserve some heritage, add a little constructive chaos? Can <laughs> private enterprise do that? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but one has to find an economic rationale for it. Because after all, we're responsible to shareholders. Sorry to bring in such low and base matters <laughs> in this audience. <laughs> we, do, we talk about those in the Financial Times. Right. <laughs> and, and so I, I think that over time, uh, people will figure out an, a, an economically viable way to do it. But I nonetheless believe that still some government involvement is necessary. For example, s in several of my developments in the mainland of China, uh, of shopping centers, we all have part of the, uh, the old buildings that were original on the site restored mm -hmm. right, and open to the public. And frankly, uh, if the government doesn't require me to do that, I would still preserve it, but I will move it somewhere else. <laughs> The government required me to do it so, uh, right on spot. So I, I, I have to architecturally blend them into my modern shopping center with the uh, old buildings. And I think that it is a, a very pleasant thing uh, for the citizens of the city to be in modernity and yet be reminded that we have history and culture.
Um, there's a man in the third row, and I'm going to go to... Yes, I'm uh, Tom Manning, uh, University of Chicago. Uh, most of our conversation has been about preserving culture, mm. rest restoration and the like, and yet much of urbanization in the next decade will be about building brand new cities. Mm -hmm. Seems to me this panel is particularly well qualified to advise a new mayor of a prospective new city on how to actually build culture mm -hmm. into that city from day one and make culture part of the beginning of the city, not something retrospectively yeah. created decades afterwards. What advice would you have for that new mayor? Yeah, thank you. But the thing is, um, although we've sort of talked about mainly about the built heritage, I mean, equally important is the intangible heritage and the creative industries. I mean, I read recently that $650 billion uh, a year comes from, is generated by the cultural creative industries. And it's quite, it's, it's certain that that is uh, 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 something quite sustainable, really, because, I mean, it employs a lot of people, it, it's, it's based on people's um, creativity. And I think that the, every city, in order for it to have a mark and to be different from other cities, should first start taking stock of what resources you have, including human resources, not just built heritage or natural heritage resources, but the living culture, you know? And, and the fact that in certain cities they, they have uh, like festivals of different ethnic groups, I think that this can also be a unifying force rather than a divisive force. And, and where museums, I think, can play a super important role is that by um, taking the hallmarks of life, you know, from birth to puberty to marriage to death, and have that theme that is common to every human being and feature that in in, in explaining and, and uh, diffusing what culture is. I mean, they, they did that at the, the New York um, uh, Museum of Natural History. I was invited to speak at one point, and I thought that was such a brilliant way of making people understand that there are differences, but we're all alike also in some ways. You know? um, it, huh? Jim first, and then Ona. I, I think the, the greatest um, uh, design blueprint I know is Daniel Burnham's plan here in Chicago itself. And, and it's, it's about integrating mm -hmm. the city, tying it back together again, and using public space to do so. Mm -hmm. And public space that isn't just ceremonial space, but space that is about the life yeah. of the citizens. So it, it, it makes sense in Chicago to put not only the Art Institute, but uh, the other museums, here, but also the public library, when it was the, the Chicago Libra Public Library when it was down the street. You know, the fact that it would bring people in, but where people want to go and need to go to mm -hmm. find meaning in their lives mm -hmm. and knit it together. It doesn't have to be all of it in one place. We don't have to have a great red square of cultural institutions, but rather we need to distribute it. But we need to know where are the important parts in the city that are crucial for bringing the city together again. Los Angeles, maybe not a city on the terms we've been talking about, nevertheless, it's an aggregation of activities and, and people and domiciles. And you put the activities and domiciles together in meaningful ways, and I think you've got a reasonable chance of success. And Anna, what would you? To, to come back to your question, is f I think if they could disconnect the power of politicians in how to uh, redesign or to build a city, I think that's so important because we should create two separate teams, the politicians and, and the, the, the constructors and etc. But the culture level is always depending about the, the, the yes or the no for the politicians itself. And we see when we are entering in a, a city to build an, uh, a new installation, we need always to flip that in between the elections, because when we arrive to the elections, they're always afraid of the known voters. So if I can say to the future mayors of the future cities, please make two different teams that we as creative people, we can really create and organize on the field itself the things that we really need to do. And because the time that we all, we need always to wait to have that yes, it's, we lose so much time for the people, sorry. Question in the front row. Thank you, uh, I'm Elisa Harris. Um, I wanted to ask the panelists about the threats to cultural heritage ar around the world, the threats from political and religious extremists. We've seen the Taliban in Afghanistan and more recently ISIS in Syria just destroying unbelievable uh, cultural 
institutions, uh, structures. And it seems as if the world is just sort of watching, has been just watching this happen and, and nothing uh, is being done. What, if anything, can be done to prevent this in the future? Jim, I know this is a big subject for you. Yeah, uh, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna be critical of the United Nations on this point, in this regard. Um, and it's not only because of the United Nations, it is because the legacy of the Peace of Westphalia, but which is to say, we have outsourced, the world has outsourced what we call, and UNESCO awesome. calls it, the, 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 well, the heritage of humankind. We've outsourced it to nation states. So that Syria is on the terms of the United Nations because it's a sovereign state in charge of its sovereign borders, not in control of its sovereign borders, but in charge of its sovereign borders responsible for its cultural, the cultural heritage that is within those borders. Uh, we, have, we have no means of going in other than aggressively assuming a position to go in and, and take charge and control those, those sites. Those sites are Syria's to do with as Syria wants to do with them. And that was true with the Taliban in Afghanistan. They were in authority there. They had, the, they had the authority to deal with it as they wished. We wa have to sit back and watch it happen. Now, there are means of doing so. There are blue helmets, of yeah, course, that can go in. But the blue helmets on the terms of the United Nations can only go in when invited by the local authorities to come in. Syria is not going to invite them to come in. Uh, and the Security Council can, has to be unanimous in its agreement to support this. Mm -hmm. The United States and Russia are not going to come to agreement. Mm -hmm. So we're going to sit back and watch it happen. And the, the, the Getty and many other institutions are developing uh, satellite-based uh, observation systems by which we can document the destruction, but only all, that's all we can do is document the destruction. Uh, and the, and so, so I think we've got to find a way to overcome the limitations of sovereignty when it comes to this. One last thing. When there's portable objects, we're talking about uh, built heritage, we're talking about temples and things that are being destroyed as we seem to be destroyed. When we're talking about portable objects, the, the uh, international uh, commitment now is to return them mm. to the places from which they've been taken. Uh, 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 improperly taken, illegally taken, let's say, but return them to them. Often that puts them back into harm's way. We don't even have safe harbors to hold them until they can be returned safely. We have, uh, and, and you were part of this, we, had, uh, we have places to put refugees yeah. until they can be returned safely to the places they want to go back to. We don't have those for works of art. Works of art are, are either going to be held illegally someplace else or they're going to be returned into harm's way. So we've got to find another means of doing it than we're doing now. Um, we're running out of time, so I just want to ask a very quick question of each member of the panel, which is to name your single greatest sort of cultural city or installation or place. Um, and Jim, for you, I'd also just like to, f to finish with you by asking, we're obviously in the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, you ran it for a long time. What single object would you like everyone in the room to have walked past before we leave <laughs> today? So I want you to think about that. And oh, no, everyone, if you can start with you, if you had to... For me, one of the most beautiful things I ever saw, actually two things. It's Bagan, it's in Myanmar. Yeah. It's when you land in, in uh, Bagan, the moment that you go out of the, of the, the small airport, you have two or three thousand temples. You just can walk in and walk out. And the other thing is uh, nearby here are the, the sequoia trees, the big gigantic trees. And mm. these trees are pointing to us to... Uh, to show how small we are, whatever we do on this planet, we should take care about it. Ronnie. 20, 30 years ago, Hong Kong was considered as a cultural desert. The government then, under the British, never uh, devoted anything uh, to it. No resources, and the private sectors are also to be blamed because we are too busy making money. I think in the last 20, 30 years, uh, 20, say, say 10, 20 years, Hong Kong has evolved into a very, very vibrant artistic uh, center of that whole part of the world. So much so that uh, Christie, Sotheby, everybody is at our doors. Part of that is because mainland Chinese are begin, begin to buy arts big time, right, a hugely big time. Uh, but I really believe that public-private partnership is really a great way to go. It's not the only way, but I think it's really a great way. Uh, allow me to just tell you one project, and that is uh, I, I spent 13 years restoring that. That's a, that's a headquarter of the Asia Society yeah. uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, Ambassador Chang Chang Chi is our vice chair there, uh, in, uh, globally, of the Asia Society. We took some uh, the, the second oldest colonial structure in the whole of Hong Kong, and then using a, a New York architect, we did a c competition globally, and the, the architect did a fantastic job just turning the whole place. I think, Minjai, you've been there. Yeah. Turning it into this 
amazing place where it, it blends the new and the old. Uh, and it is put in such a way that is modernity uh, is, is is there, but yet you also have some not antiquity, but it's history there, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 it's now the intellectual and uh, artistic uh, center, uh, one of the centers in Hong Kong. Before you, you all know the M Plus Museum that they are building with the government funding, very huge, but that is few uh, it, it politics, you know, take up what you used to do, but in the private sector because we use our own money, I raise all the money. And so we're able to do things in a much better way that the government alone can do. Uh, but without the government help, we don't have the land and we can do it either. So I, I think public-private collaboration is something that uh, many cities should look into. Right. Very quickly, Sultan, and then... Uh, so again, it's, it's cliche, but for me, really, the, the, the oasis of tolerance and, and, and respect for each other that we have in Dubai uh, is, is something that is, it's not the Dubai that you know, the glass towers and the, the skyscrapers, which, you know, which is the stereotype, but really is between the streets where people from across the Middle East uh, interact with each other, live with each other. And it's the place where, uh, you know, when they had a survey of uh, Middle Easterners under 30, where did they want to go? Where did they aspire to live in? And it was the city of Dubai. So I think it's so important mm -hmm. for, for humanity that a place like Dubai exists and continue to, to uh, prosper. Yes, well, it's really difficult, you know, when you've been dealing with uh, over a thousand World Heritage Sites and everything is, you know, has its great beauty. But when you really think about culture and creativity, it comes, I want to say something that's much more fundamental. You know, I'm not at all opposed to grand cultural institutions. It's, it's great. I think people should be developing these things. But the city that I mentioned earlier of Luang Prabang, the former capital of a tiny little, one of the poorest countries in the world, Laos. You know, it's because of nature culture link, the, the, the urban pattern, the architectural fusion. It's the sort of place that you walk down the street and you want to be creative. I mean, it's just so uh, inspirational, you know, that you just, it's the sort of place that you really want to, you feel relaxed and you, you want to be creative. And I think that is also a very important aspect of, uh, it's not a global city, but it's global in different ways in terms of value, and I think that's what I think we're trying to promote as well. Sorry, the telephone. <laughs> That's all right, Jim. Uh, very quickly, my city is London, and I have two quick stories, and they, they both have to do with the National Gallery in London. In the first instance, it was the middle of the 19th century where the pollution of London was at its, not at its peak, but at very extreme levels. And there was talk even, even of moving the collection of the National Gallery because it was thought to be at risk because of the dirt of the air out of central London to either south London, Kensington, or to Hampstead, north London. And there was even a parliamentary inquiry into this and deba debate about this. And the assumption was it would not only be good for works of art if they were moved out of central London, but actually it would be good for the people of eastern London, the, the poor people of eastern London, because they could get exercise walking to mm. these distant places. To, and parliament said, no, you've got to keep it in the center of London. You've got to figure out a way to protect it from the envir harmful environment. So that was one story. The other story was from the Second World War when they, uh, when they, t they took the, the collections from the National Gallery out and they put them into caves in Wales to protect them against bombing. Because London, of course, was a great target of bombing at the time. And uh, local people began to write into the Times of London newspaper and say, you know, the building is empty. That is our building. It belongs to us. It is a sign of, of, of our resilience. We need to have something in that building. So they brought back a picture from the case. Uh, so the a picture would be on view as long as there was a picture in the gallery that they were there was a sign that they had they were not defeated that they were they were withstanding the, the onslaught of the mm. so it was kind of a hugely symbolic moment because of the place that it holds in the life of the citizens of London. Mm. And your um, art institute final moment. Sirah's grand shop. Say again. Sirah, uh, the painter's painting grand shop, the island of the grand shop. Um, is, a, is a painting uh, that is, of course, painted by a young man who lived only a short time and had an extraordinary career and an impact on European painting, but it was acquired by a family uh, for the Art Institute of Chicago. It never went to that family's, they, they could never have brought it into their apartment and their house. It was too big, but they brought it for the people of uh, Chicago and all that, who come to Chicago. That is a perfect point to end on. Um, we have another talk for a very, so don't leave yet. There's another talk in for a quick one for 10 minutes, and then there's coffee. I'd just like to, uh, if you can join me in thanking all of the panellists for, I think, an excellent panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, in fact, we owe a lot to...